Um, I feel like I've been talking about observability for a long time, and I just kind of felt like it would be more fun to talk about observability in complex systems, but also testing in production. Um, since I brought my shirt and everything. <laughs> um, I meant to bring some shirts for you guys, but I forgot. Oh well. Um, how many of you here have I never met before, like in person? I should have asked it the other way. <laughs> how many of you have I met before, or seen, met in person, been at the same conference? Really? Oh, that's great. I start to feel like everybody's heard everything that I have to say. Maybe I'm being unnecessarily um, self-conscious about that. That's wonderful. <laughs> everything I say is going to sound fun, smart to you. <laughs> All right, that might be overstating the case somewhat. Anyway, let's get on with it. Um, I apologize if a couple of my slides are out of order. <laughs> it was a, probably not smart, but eh, oh well. We'll go with what the slides tell us to do. Uh, my name is Charity. Um, I am an accidental, I'm an intentional co-founder, accidental CEO. <laughs> Long story. You'll have to buy me drinks uh, if you want to hear it. Um, I'm also the co-author of the Database Reliability Engineering book. If you happen to have bought it, you'll notice that on the cover, the cover is broken in stores. It has a boring horse on it. I apologize. O'Reilly doesn't let you have mythical creatures. <laughs> <clears throat> but I, I can fix it for you. I have stickers that you can apply to your book. So DM me your address if you want me to send you one. I can take care of this, this problem for you. Um, and I am an operations engineer by nature, which is why this is basically how I feel about software. It's the only good diff is a red diff. Software, man, it really just causes problems. And then people want to use more software to fix the software problems they have. It's a whole thing. Um, so I started thinking about all the things that I really wanted to talk about, and I was just jotting down the list, and I was like, <sighs> software ownership, definitely, senior engineering. Um, on call, so-called chaos engineering, uh, democratizing the access to tooling and data, mm, <clears throat> feature flags, we're definitely going to get to feature flags, <clears throat> the future of, of development is ODD, <laughs> TDD is overdue for an upgrade, um, why do we really have to stop leaning on intuition and tribal knowledge? All right, so there's a lot of shit here, um, which is why Honestly, if at any point you want to argue with me or ask me to go deeper into something or if it didn't really make sense, um, just say so because I respond very well to interruptions and ad hoc questions. So, um, but Let's start right off the bat with testing and production. Now, I believe testing and production has been unfairly maligned. And I blame this guy. <laughs> it's funny. <laughs> it's very funny. And I respect that. Um, but it really implies that you can only do one or the other. You can test before prod or YOLO, which is not actually true. Um, <laughs> this really leads to all the memes on the internet. It was really fun. Uh, well, what if I told you you could do both, right? What if you could responsibly test before production and also accept that there's just a certain amount of irreducible unknowableness Every single combination of a point in time, plus an artifact, plus the state of your infrastructure, plus the scripts used to deploy it, is unique. As anyone who's ever typoed production <laughs> as an environment knows very well, there's only so much you can test. Um, now, <laughs> I define prod as just where your users are. And prod is the only place that matters. Everything else is disposable. In fact, I would argue that for many of us, it's completely optional and perhaps um, counter, um, <laughs> runs counter to the health of your systems to have, have, have staging. Um, but we'll get to that. Um, first and foremost, do not send um, people to me going, Charity said that you don't have to test anymore. <laughs> This is not the point of this talk. I'm here to tell you how to do it better. I care about quality. I actually really do. Um, and I'm convinced that testing and production is the only way to have really good systems. And I want to help us do it better. Um, honestly, there's so much about our entire concept of the software development lifecycle that is overdue for an upgrade. 
in the era of distributed systems, starting with the concept of flipping a switch and deploying. Right? That's the, that's the metaphor that we usually talk about. We have it in our minds. It's a switch, but it is not a switch. <laughs> it is not a switch at all. It does not happen instantly. And your confidence doesn't go from zero to 100. Just blah. It doesn't work that way. It's more like putting your cookies in the oven and turning it on. <laughs> One at a time, maybe. And slowly over time, as your code is exposed to more um, scenarios under various loads, different times of the year, whatever, you can gain confidence. How many of you self-identify as operations or SRE or DevOpsy stuff? Cool. Software engineers? And MISC? <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> uh, I assume some database folks, some product people, um, testers. What else? Anything? Anything interesting that I should know about? No? OK, cool. Um, well. Deploying code is beginning the process of gaining confidence in your code. Anyone from ops knows this incredibly well. As soon as you've deployed some code, um, your suspicion should be at its peak. <laughs> Absolute maximum suspicion for new code. Um, and, and it can go down over time if you're lucky. Um, deploying code in reality looks something more like this. It's a continuum with rainbows on it. Um, with success at one end, um, and sometimes you deploy, sometimes you have to roll back, maybe you've done a partial deploy, you have a few versions out there in the wild, sometimes you have to do some cherry picking, some rollbacks, some reversions, um, yeah, there's some trash fires, um, okay, and then sometimes, you know, you've got your chaos monkey that's adding a little bit of extra fun, <laughs> and then they want to add chaos engineering on top of this, like, come on. Um, <laughs> Uh, this is what deploys look like in my mind. I don't know about yours. <laughs> um, and fixing this is going to um, involve two things. Um, recognizing that the development process extends way out into production and that the production process, uh, especially observability, stretches way back into dev um, to the very first code of line of code that you write. <sighs> Why now? Well, that's a great question. I'm glad you asked. Um, I'm a music major, um, so when I try to do science, sometimes it just looks like that. <laughs> Nevertheless, I have a graph, so you know it's true. Um, Complexity is going up. It's going up a lot, really fast. Um, I toss that word complexity around a lot. It actually really annoys me when people start talking about complexity because they're usually using it as a placeholder for something they don't really want to think about very hard. So let's look at something a little bit more meaningful than my shitty graph. Um, well, on the left, there is the humble lamp stack. And let's just take a moment to say, if you can solve your problems with a lamp stack, please do so. Every time, do not, <laughs> do not um, invoke the wrath of Kubernetes and fucking Docker and all this shit. If you can solve it with a LAMP stack, do yourself a favor and just do it. The problem is, many of us increasingly cannot. And so we are wading into the rest of this mess. Um, the one in the middle there, that's um, Parse's infrastructure diagram from 2015. You'll note that the middle blob there is a few hundred MongoDB replica sets. Um, there's a, you know, we just let developers all over the world develop mobile apps by writing queries and uploading them to us, and we just had to make them all work without interfering with any of their neighbors' queries. Some of them were doing 5x full table scans. N never do this. Never do this. Um, it's very popular. Terrible problems. Oh, and that system's looping back into itself, right? So. Any single node slowing down can theoretically infect the latency for everything <coughs> else. Um, oh, we also let developers just write their own JavaScript and upload it, and we just had to make it all work. It's magic for the developer. Um, and this here on the right is the national electrical grid of my country, obviously. And this is what we should have in our minds when we are thinking about building systems, not that. That beautiful, simple little lamp stack where you could just have a couple dashboards on the wall, glance at them, and intuitively know exactly what was going wrong. Those were good times. 
Now it's more like this, um, where you cannot keep it all in your head. Please don't try. Um, you shouldn't try. You shouldn't try to keep state for a distributed system in your head. You should have it in a tool where everyone has access to the same state and can interact with it. And that's your source of truth, not whatever shitty cache you have in your head, because I guarantee it's not up to date. Um, so with a, with a distributed system like this, what you're worrying about is not, um, you know, oh, the database ran out of connections. It's stuff like, uh, well, a tree is down on Main Street in this little shitty town in Iowa. Couldn't predict it. <laughs> Shouldn't try. You just kind of have to embrace the chaos and look for ways to quickly identify it, notify, like notice it, triage it, and fix it. Uh, those are hyperlocal problems, right? Other problems of distributed systems will be things like, you know, uh, every bolt that was manufactured in 2004 is rusting three times as fast as all the other bolts. Okay, so you have to be collecting your information at a level that will let you identify these patterns, right? What do all these failures have in common? What are the outliers? And again, you can't, it, you know, we used to do a fair amount of work trying to predict how our systems would go wrong so that we could find those scenarios and fix them quickly. We set up all these paging alerts for like, well, if connections are running high or if like we're running out of memory or if we're running... But fuck all that. You cannot trace that rabbit anymore. You will die. <laughs> instead, you have to take a step back and force yourself to not do too much predicting and instead um, go, well, don't know what's going to happen. It's cool. <laughs> I can deal with it. I'm going to gather information at the right level of detail so that I can interact with it, I can explore, I can answer any arbitrary question that happens to arrive. Arise. New scenarios that have never occurred to me before. Ooh, I've got some of those later on. <laughs> this, uh, this also parallels like this, this shift from a world of mostly known unknowns to unknown unknowns is what I think of as a shift from monitoring to observability. Um, and those have very different, distinct technical terms that we'll get to shortly. First, I want to talk about your system, which you probably think is working right now. I guarantee you it's not. <laughs> never, actually. It, it, your system's never actually up. Never actually working perfectly. If you think it is, you just don't have good enough tooling. Um, so many catastrophes are lurking right now that you don't know about yet. So, sleep tight. <laughs> um, and this matters more and more to us because we are all, whether we chose it or not, we are increasingly distributed systems engineers. Point of order, the first distributed systems engineers were web programmers. Like the front indie type. Um, mad respect for those kids. Um, we're all distributed systems engineers now. I'm pretty sure this means we get a raise. <laughs> <I'm still waiting. laughs> The unknowns have outstripped the knowns, and the unknowns, because they're unknown, that means they're untestable. I really think of monitoring as being the exact, the operational analog to unit tests, right? Software engineers have unit, if you can predict how the thing's gonna break, you write a test for it, right? You predict how the system is gonna break, you write a monitoring check for it. I'm not saying that's useless at all. It is necessary, it's just not enough. Distributed systems are incredibly hostile to being cloned, or imitated, or predicted, or monitored, or understood. <laughs> Sorry. Um, you know, and I, I've, I've written a particular piece of software three times now in my life for doing like the gold standard of testing the databases, which is um, if you have a very tricky database change or migration to do, you literally have to sniff 24 hours worth of traffic, um, reconstruct the transactions, and replay it, you know, making one change at a time, or you know, adjusting concurrency, or number of clients, all this stuff. Um, and that, that's as good as you can get for like, trying to test everything about the world today. Still doesn't tell you jack shit about the world tomorrow, unfortunately. And it is of almost, uh, it's of diminishing returns that reach nearly zero for everything except for databases. You, can, you could, in theory, spin up a copy of Facebook and sniff a day's worth of traffic. It's theoretically doable, right? And replay it. Um, nobody's going to pay for that. <laughs> they shouldn't. Um, and even if they did, it's not going to tell you which celebrity is going to die tomorrow and break it in new and exciting ways. Because because distributed systems have 
not a set of known errors that you can just put in a run book and call it good. They have an infinitely long list of things that almost never happened except that one time they did. Or they intersected with five other almost impossible things that had to happen in order for you to trip over that scenario. It makes staging basically useless. Because <laughs> staging becomes a black hole for engineering time if you try to care about it with the same attention to detail and quality as you're accustomed to. Um, and this is not net neutral. It's not okay to just keep throwing your life force down the black hole of staging because we all have limited engineering cycles to spend on problems that matter to us. And the more engineering cycles we flush down the staging shitter, the fewer we can spend on production. All, I'm not saying that you should leave here and go back to your manager and go, Charity says shut down everything but prod. I mean, maybe I'm saying that, but I'm not telling you to say that I'm saying that. All I'm saying is, <laughs> all I'm saying is, tell them, we are systematically underinvesting in the guardrails around production and the tooling that we need to deploy safely. And we need to take some of these cycles that we are spending trying to keep staging and sync with prod and all these other impossible things, and we need to be spending more of them on production. How many of you here think that your, your, your company puts enough thought and attention into your deploy software? One. That's better than I've ever seen it. I have not seen a single company that puts enough effort. You know, and what do we do? We put interns on that shit. This is the most important software that you will ever run at your company, because you run it every day, I hope, right? And you're going to give it to your intern and not even code review it? This is how we usually treat it. Put our best software engineers on it, just to signal that we care about it. Pro tip. That's how I feel about it. <laughs> anyway. Um, you can only actually verify any unique combination of artifact, time, infrastructure, software, um, by deploying to that environment. Which, like, I, I keep getting people trying to argue with me about this, and I'm sorry, it's just logic. <laughs> I'm not saying anything other than that you, you cannot test everything. Therefore, we should admit that we test in pride so that we do a better job of it. That's as far as I'm going to argue with some people. Um, deploy, deploy strips are production code. Treat it with respect, honestly. It's so easy to get dragged down and bike shedding about this stuff because it doesn't really matter as much, right? We'll have all these arguments, these incredibly ornate arguments about things the less that they matter. Um, I really like what Bo Lyndon has to say about production, which is that um, we should all be trying to get our teams to spend as much of our time in prod as possible because that is the time when we're building the rich intuitions. Um, that's when we're interacting with tooling in the way that matters. Literally every other environment is just practice. It doesn't matter. And if you're so trained to um, think that the way that your staging database runs a, a, a column migration, whoa, are you going to be surprised next time you try running something on prod, right? Um, build guardrails. I'm not saying like do stupid shit, but it actually makes us less safe when we don't regularly have everyone practice being in prod and treating it with respect. If, if everyone's used to just going blah, 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 drop database, blah, 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 you're going to have a bad time of it eventually. When everybody's used to treating it with respect and everybody has the right muscle memory, when you've looped your designer into it, honestly, have your designer take a look at, is it easy to do the right things and hard to do the scary things? Super useful. Um, or like, give your CEO like a root shell and see what they do. <laughs> What's the worst that could happen? It's probably fine. It's probably fine. Basically, that's, 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 the, entire, that's the entire moral of the story. It's probably fine. Um, staging is not production. Almost every error is recoverable from, <laughs> except data problems. But <clears throat> let's move on. Another key question here is why do people sink so much energy into staging when they can't even tell if production is healthy or not? <laughs> you should also monitor staging if you happen to have it. Um, I feel like, um, you know how Martin Fowler says you, you must be this tall to ride this ride with microservices? Um, your observability must be this good before you're allowed to just go fucking around with your prod systems. How about that? Um, you're not allowed to do any chaos engineering 
You're not allowed to insert any more chaos into your systems until you can look at your systems and identify the chaos that is already there. I'm not saying you don't have to do anything about it, but you should be able to know what's there. You should be able to see the impact of the chaos that you have intentionally gone and injected. I know some people who have gone like, we're gonna like do all this hot shit, you know, chaos engineering. We're gonna so they go and run the chaos tool on their systems and three weeks later they figure out that they broke something. You're not tall enough to write this right. <laughs> Without observability, it's just chaos. Sorry, you've probably got enough of that already. If you can't tell if you have multiple versions running in production, you're not allowed to add any more. Um, I also think it's important, you know, for software engineers especially, um, and I recognize that we really, we haven't really had the tooling that has empowered you to do this, um, but it should be muscle memory. When you ship code, you should go and look at it. Um, did, did what you wanted to do actually happen? Does anything else look weird? Um, you can catch 80% of the bugs with like 20% of the effort here, and you should. Um, but, you know, users will never notice most of the terrible things we ship to prod if we just go and look at it. Um, we all need to get in the habit of watching our code run with reality attached to it. Yeah, I, I hate to break it to you, but like running your code in your laptop does not tell you anything. It tells you that it compiled, probably, if it's a compilable language. Even then, it's kind of iffy. Um, it doesn't mean anything. Code doesn't mean anything until it hits reality, which means real infrastructure and real users. Um, so like, just like heuristics about what to test before prod versus in prod, you know, just test before prod, does it work? Does it run? Does it fail in the predictable ways? That's like step one, right, on the path to nirvana. Everything else kind of has to be done in prod. If it's behavioral testing, if it's experiments, um, low tests. I, I know some people, and I actually really endorse this, who run a consistent, a constant 20% load test in their systems at all times. They've got 20% headroom <laughs> anytime they run out. Um, Edge cases are only going to ever show. You know, people spend so much time and energy trying to reproduce weird edge cases on staging instead of just watching for them in production. It's insane. <laughs> You're trying to reproduce something that you don't even know how to make it happen. It's <laughs> Rolling deploys. Um, more reasons, you know, your testing DR, blah, blah, blah. Beta programs, play more frequently. Test before prod doesn't work. Test after prod, everything else. Known unknowns and unknown unknowns, right? Test in staging, eh, well, if you want to. <laughs> there are risks. You know, there's nothing in life that's free. There are trade-offs involved. Um, you do need to be careful to, you know, isolate any test accounts that you're using um, by using like a different namespace or something. Um, you never want your users to be able to tell, right? You can do it ever the hell you want in prod if your users cannot tell. That's my golden rule. Um, saturating resource, if you're running a load test, and you're pretty sure you're, if you're trying to saturate a, a, a resource, um, make it a piece of the resource, you know, and watch it so you catch it immediately. This isn't, this isn't hard, it just takes attention. Um, but if you're, if you're gonna lobby for this, um, don't YOLO it, you need to earn trust. Right? And, uh, and you start out with very little, as you should. So, build and use feature flags. Oh, everyone across the board, get your code into production so much faster. Um, it's a little risk. You need high cardinality tooling so you can do cool things like, you know, break down by, you know, guess what? Uh, build ID is an infinitely incrementing atomic number. <laughs> Quite high cardinality there. You need to be able to break down so you can compare. So you can have that muscle memory of going to look. Did what I just expect, did what I just deploy actually work the way I expect it to? How is it different from the last version? Uh, Canary is super useful once you've gotten past that point where you care a little bit more about reliability than speed getting code out. Um, shadow systems where you fork traffic and return the good request, super useful for rewrites, blah, blah, blah. But honestly, um, be less afraid is my... And, and I recognize that there are probably many different cultures and teams represented in this room, and for some of you this is terrible advice, so I'm trusting you to know that. Is, is, that, is that a bad assumption? Maybe. We'll find out. <laughs> 
It's your systems, not mine. <laughs> Failure isn't rare. Like, it, it's never been rare. It's just that you haven't really had the tools to find out that it wasn't rare. None of us are paging ourselves whenever there's any error. It's always about when the errors reach a certain threshold that is perhaps worth a human knowing about it. And this is a really important distinction to keep in mind. Uh, people don't realize this, and that's why they get all bent out of shape about sampling. Like, dudes, there is no condition under which you care about every request that comes in your front door. You cannot. You should not. It's impossible. So failure is when, not if. Lots and lots of wins. Does everyone know what normal looks like? You can't just let people look at their systems when they're down. Right? You're never going to have the intuition and the, and the, and the, the sense of just like, mm, something's off here. You're not going to know what you're going for. Everybody should be elbow deep in production every day, building those intuitions up. Everybody who writes code should know how to deploy and to roll back to a good known state. And everybody should be good at debugging in production. This doesn't mean that they have to have shells. I am actually anti um, software engineers having shells these days. Hell, I'm kind of anti ops people having shells too. It's kind of an anti-pattern. Uh, all right, that's a little bit fundamentalist of me and I'm not going to completely back it up. But um, SSHing in should be a sign that something's wrong with your instrumentation and you should fix it. Um, so lastly, I want to circle back to the thing uh, that I um, said I was going to talk about, which is observability. Um, just want to make sure that we're all on the same page about this. Um, it really represents the, the shift from systems where you could predict most of the ways or the categories that things were going to fail. And um, you know, once or twice a year, maybe we get super stumped. Something really weird, like a kernel bug or something really out of left field. Um, but generally, you're getting paged, and you know what it is, more or less. And you go, and you investigate, and you fix it. Um, now that traffic is going up like this, and the number of services, and the number of you know, storage types, and the number of you know, third-party services that you don't even have access to, and just like, uh, like the, the noise is, getting, is growing. I'm sure this isn't a shock to anyone. And that won't work anymore if you want to sleep and have some sanity left over. Um, it's really worth redoubling your efforts to um, Fixing or silencing or accounting in your SLOs, SLAs for, for some level of noise so that every time you get paged, honestly, it should be something new, something that you do not know about, something you haven't encountered before. I recognize this is a lofty goal, but it's not that far out of reach, honestly. Um, you, should, you should not go, oh, that again. It should always be, huh, weird. Anytime you get paged, it should be an engineering problem, not a support problem, right? There are just too many of these support problems. We, they need to be put in a different, you should, only, you should only want to get paged about these engineering problems. Um, now, the observability definition, I told you we were gonna talk about definitions a little bit. How much time do I have left? I forgot to check. Oh, sweet. He says, you can just keep talking all day, is what I heard. <laughs> But this comes from control theory. Now, like I said, I'm a music major, so I had to read all, up about this in Wikipedia. Uh, but it's on the internet, so I'm sure it's true. Um, <clears throat> observability in control theory um, means how much can you understand about the internal states of the system um, by looking at it on the outside, by inferring from the knowledge of the external states. Um, so to me, if you apply that to software systems, it means Observability is how well can you understand the inner workings of your system just by asking questions from the outside. Not by SSHing in and running strace in the binary, you know, not by getting out your microscope, but just like standing back, having your established tool set, and being able to ask any, any new question. Anything can come up that you've never seen before, and you should be able to understand it without, and this is key, without shipping new code. Right? Doesn't count if you have to write new code to understand a new scenario. It's about gathering the right level of detail, the right level of, um, of abstraction, um, so that you have what you need to explore and explain anything that's happening to your complex distributed system. This is super fun and fascinating and interesting. Um, 
and also makes it possible to deal with these systems because otherwise, um, it's honestly just not. Um, you have an observable system when your team is not freaked out by these, you know, a few times a day, something totally weird happens. Um, at Parse, like, I'll, okay, I'll tell you why I started Honeycomb in an abbreviated um, version. Um, so around, uh, so I've made a career basically about of being the first uh, ops or infrastructure person who joins a company when they're small, and, and it's like maybe a real product, we'll see. And I help it grow up. I really like scaling. And I did this at Parse, it was mobile back into the service. And around 2013, I think we had 60,000 mobile apps, we got acquired by Facebook, and I was coming to the horrified conclusion or suspicion that we had somehow, with some of the best engineers in the world, built a system that was effectively undebuggable <laughs> by anyone. Uh, <laughs> This does not feel good. Uh, a few times a day, someone would come to me like, Parse is down! I'd be like, Parse is not down! Like, behold, my wall full of dashboards. Like, it's all green. It's, we're good. And they'd be like, very upset. I'm like, maybe it's Disney, right? And they're doing four requests mm -hmm. per second. And I'm doing 100,000 requests per second. Never shows up in my time series aggregates. So I would have to go or dispatch someone to go and try and figure out what it was by hand. Did I mention that they got to write their own JavaScript code and queries and just upload them <laughs> any time um, with no warning? And then we were also shipping all the time, writing new queries all the time. And there were also a bunch of noisy neighbor problems because they're all co-located in these same clusters. It was a clusterfuck. Oh my god. It could take a day or more to track down. And sometimes it, I just had to call it off. It was I'm like, they're paying us 50 bucks a month. We can't. Like, product development just ground to a halt because we were trying to understand all these one-offs every day. And like, this is a kiss of death for a platform when you have to think about individual apps, right? Um, and I was just fucking stumped. <laughs> I tried every tool out there, and it was not helping. Um, until I found this one, any Facebook people here, or ex-Facebook people? I found this one gnarly ass little tool, aggressively hostile to users, like it hates you. Uh, very ugly doesn't do much, but it does one thing and one thing well, and that is it takes um, dimensions of arbitrarily high cardinality and lets you slice and dice in near real time. And when I say high cardinality, I mean, imagine you have a collection of 100 million users. Um, the highest cardinality dimension will be any like unique ID, right? Um, like a request ID. Um, first name, last name, very high cardinality, less than unique. Um, gender is low cardinality, and species equals human is, I assume, the lowest of all. Um, so all of the monitoring and metrics products out there exclusively deal with low cardinality dimensions, which are not useful for debugging at all. I've got four availability zones, so I can track that. Fuck. <laughs> User ID, nope, nope. Query, out of the picture. Um, can track, mm, yeah, anyway. So it lets you take all these unique IDs and all these queries, raw queries, and we were just able to go like our time to like explaining these complex problems dropped from a day or more to like not even minutes. It was like seconds, and it was predictable. It was like every time. Like it was, it was a support problem. It wasn't even an engineering problem anymore. And then because I'm in ops, I didn't even stop to think about why. As soon as I fixed it, I moved on to the next problem. And it wasn't until I was leaving Facebook that I suddenly went, oh shit. I don't know how to engineer anymore without the stuff that we've built. Like, it's become so core to how I experience the world. Like, it's not even just about, oh, the site's down or there's a problem. It's about how do I decide what I want to build? Uh, you know, like last week we rolled out this, this compression feature. Well, we didn't start by just writing code and shipping it. That would be stupid. We started by instrumenting around the storage stuff so that we could see how much space we were going to, going to reclaim if we wrote it, right? And we were seeing the distribution of users. Like, is everyone going to be affected? No, some are actually going to have more storage. Some are going to have way less since we were able to see, is this worth doing, right? And at every step when we ship code, we're able to just check, oh, is this doing what we expected it to? Hey, is it not? Because storage, may I remind you, scary. Um, so uh, I was planning on, on going to be an engine manager at Stripe or Slack or something, realized that I couldn't actually be effective or engineer anymore without this tool, so I decided to go build it. Um, but um, at the time, I really just thought that this was a platform problem, like exclusively. 
because platforms all have this characteristic of, you know, it's, it's, not one, it's not one site that you have to worry about, it's end sites, and every single one of them think that they matter. <laughs> um, and it was over the course of that first year that I slowly realized, oh, this is not just a platform problem, this is actually, this is an everyone problem, this is, this is just a pure, fu it's a function of complexity. And the possible number, range of outcomes or answers that you could be looking for, and oh wow, everybody, everybody is kind of slowly going towards this cliff because everybody's start, starting to do th terrible things to themselves like uh, microservices or you know, Kubernetes and schedulers and like all these ephemeral infrastructure components that barely exist and they blip out of existence and you still have to care about them. Can't index the shit, can't predict it, right? Everybody's starting to have this problem. Um, where was I? Right, so I got some examples to kind of illustrate the difference. Um, and then I'm done. Ten minutes. Perfect. So, this problem. Everybody has debugged this before, right? Photos are loading slowly for some people. Why? Lamp stack. Pretty simple, straightforward. Like, these are some things that we've all seen debugged. <coughs> Running out of connections, blah, blah, blah. Cool. Monitor those things. Done. Characteristics of these systems. <clears throat> Known unknowns. Friendly to intuition. And that last one is, is subtle and important. The health of the system basically correlate, corresponds to the experience of your users. So if your uptime is 99.5%, half a percent of the time, somebody's getting an error and pretty evenly distributed. Um, best practices are actual alerts, run books, blah, blah, blah. Okay, cool. Now the fun part. Now, now here are some actual um, scenarios, problems, outages from Parse and Instagram. <laughs> Not exactly sure what I'm supposed to monitor for in any of these cases. <clears throat> I've got more. Latency reverts the historical mean, but only on Tuesdays. There's no cron job, guarantee you, not a cron job. <laughs> <coughs> I can do this all day. <coughs> that that um, <coughs> Eastern Europe one was one of my favorites, all time favorites. They're like, pushes down. I'm like, no, it's not. I'm getting pushes and it's in a queue. Ergo, pushes fine. The next day they're like, pushes down. Finally figured it out. Um, so Android devices, I don't know if it's still true, but they used to have to keep a, a socket open between the device and, and the push notification service for every device, right? And pull periodically. Um, <clears throat> so we added the composite, because you could only have like what, maybe a million device IDs per instance. <clears throat> so we'd um, put an auto scaling group and do round robin DNS, so they'd like distribute themselves over all the, all the nodes. So we added some capacity to it, which caused the DNS record um, to um, exceed the UDP packet size, which is fine. <laughs> Fails over to TCP. Everywhere in the world except for one router in Eastern Europe. And I really don't know what I'm supposed to fucking monitor for, <laughs> is the point, is the moral of the story. These are all unknown unknowns. Never happened before, not likely to happen again. And if I invest all of my time's time and energy, my team's time and energy into like the classic postmortem where you're like, well, what monitoring checks am I going to create and what dashboards am I going to make so that I can find this exact problem immediately the next time? Well, we're all fucked. <clears throat> Characteristics, unknown unknowns. You cannot model the system in your head. You really shouldn't try, um, which the, the good side of this is it gets us away from this eternal model where the best debugger is always the person who's been there the longest, right? This is the upside. We can get away from this. And the health of the system from the perspective of the person writing application code does not matter, should not matter. These time series aggregates that describe the entire system, you shouldn't care about them. The only thing that you care about is can your, can your, um, can your request complete? every single one of them. And can you slice and dice as a debugger to find them, to find the ones that fail, to see what they have in common, to see what the outliers are? <clears throat> Rich instrumentation, events, not metrics. The, so like basically, what do we need to get to go, what do we need to go where we're getting, get where we're going, whatever. Um, we need observability-driven development 
We need to look at pride. And we need tooling with these characteristics. Now a cynic might say, boy, Charity, that sure looks like honeycomb tooling. <laughs> and I would say, yes, it does, because I made those trade-offs on purpose. Um, and you can be cynical about that or not, it still works. <laughs> this is an instrumentation game. It's about getting inside the software's head. That shift in perspective is, is actually really crucial. It's not one piece of software checking up on another. It's you getting inside the software and, and seeing how it experiences the world. And this is important because it is how your user is experiencing your software. Events, not metrics. The big problem with metrics, um, like they were, they were a great, <laughs> you know, in a metric, the technical definition is a, is a number with some tags appended. <clears throat> The problem is they don't deal with high cardinality. Uh, they typically are aggregated at write time, which means you can never work your way back to the raw request. You can't ask new questions of it after you've written it to disk. But the main problem is that in order to get that one number, they've stripped away all of the connective tissue, everything about that event. So now maybe you're firing off hundreds of, of metrics, but they're scattered. You have no way of tying them together and saying, all these things described one event, all of these things were true at once, all of these things were true of request ID, blah, 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 blah. And that, it will never work. I've spent years trying to debug systems with metrics. It does not work. Metrics are great for understanding the health of the system. That is an operational use case. They are impossible <laughs> for describing the health of each request. <clears throat> blah, blah, blah. Um, uh, raise your hand if, if you still log strings that are not structured. Shame on you. <laughs> I'm sure it's not your fault. Um, go back to work and yell shame at them. Dude, strings are not, <laughs> string processing is not getting any faster. It's 2019, we're done. We're done with strings. We need structured events. We need arbitrarily wide structured events that let you tie together hundreds of details and say, this all describes this one request ID that I can now find with my high cardinality tooling. Let's do slice and dice. You care? You don't give a fuck about the forest. I assume I can swear. It's a little late, late to ask, but it's Europe, so it's fine. <laughs> you don't care about the forest. You care about the poor baby trees. That's whole stories, which is how our brains work. Dashboards can all fuck off in a fire and die. <clears throat> Every dashboard is just an artifact of some past failure, and it's useless to you. <clears throat> raw requests. If you can't get back to the raw requests, you can't have observability because you can't ask new questions. You can only ask the questions that you predicted. Aggregation is a one-way trip. Strips away all that precious context. But the, you can always derive metrics from these structured events. And the reverse is not true. You can't go back from metrics to events. Furthermore, tracing, super fucking important. And tracing is just events with, an, with a couple of fields incremented. So like if you use Honeycomb, you get tracing for free because it's just a visualization, which is also important. I do not have a slide for this, but I'm going to throw it in here anyway. This whole dancing around between tool, 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 trying to eyeball and correlate, that needs to stop. That is not science. That is terrible. <laughs> and it's expensive. Like, the reason that you're spending so much money is because you have all these different sources of truth to describe one event. It's stupid. You can't hunt needles if your tools don't have these characteristics. So we do it. Happy to show anyone a demo. So, Let's end in a very happy note. When you have tooling that lets you do this sort of thing, whether it's Honeycomb or any other TBD tool that I assume will be built any day now, these are some of the kinds of iterative questions that you can ask and just explore and just follow the breadcrumbs where they lead you. Doesn't this just give you a nice, happy feeling, just like fuzzy, just like, ah, I can make sense of this ginormous clusterfuck of a system now? Well, <laughs> it's supposed to. In the end, the moral of the story is nobody cares about your system health. All they care about is their experience. Your tooling needs to reflect that. Services need owners, not operators. And that means if you write the code, you should have the ability to deploy, to roll back, and to understand it, to look at it as it intersects with reality. Most of the times that so I've seen software engineers get put on call and it's failed terribly, it's because they didn't actually have the tools that let them do their jobs. It asked them to do two jobs. That's not okay. So, in conclusion, watch it run in production, accept no substitute. You can build better tools by thinking about distributed systems. Blah, 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 put the slides up online and have fun. And tonight, we just some broad. <laughs>
Oh, oh, last point. And you win dramatically fewer paging alerts. You can delete hundreds of those fuckers because you're using them incorrectly to help you diagnose a problem. They're not a debugging tool. They're an alarm. You should only have to deal with latency, request rate, errors, maybe saturation, and some end-to-end -end checks that traverse the things that make you money. That's it.